How's it going people? We all know supercars are some of the most sought after cars on the planet, boasting the most incredible feats in automotive engineering. However, just as with most things in this world, not all supercars retain their value in the long term, and some of them become almost affordable depending on a number of factors including demand, supply, prestige, and badge. This is pretty lucky for a lot of us, as it's unlikely I'll be able to afford a P1 or a 918 in the next few years, but it wouldn't be entirely ridiculous to imagine I might be driving one of these cars in the near future if money goes well. In this video I'm going to talk you through the top 5 cheapest supercars you can buy right now, ranked from most expensive to least expensive, and you can let me know in the comments below if you found any cheaper ones that I've missed out. Remember to like the video if you enjoy it, comment if you agree or disagree with my picks, and subscribe for more weekly car content. So without further ado, Let's get into the list. This week's special mention is the supercharged Jaguar F-Type V6. It only gets a special mention because even Jaguar themselves don't call it a supercar, but instead they class it as a sports car. However, the F-Type is renowned for its incredible exhaust note, even if it is a falsified sound to an extent. I've put a link in the description to an article all about the Jag's mental exhaust sound if you want to find out more. In simple terms, it would appear that they feed a tiny bit of petrol into the exhaust so that it explodes in there rather than in the combustion chamber, making all the pup pups as Salamondrin calls them, otherwise known as backfires. You can pick one of these up for around £32,000 and you know it's going to provide you with some incredible enjoyment in the long term. I'd steer clear currently though, as the F-Type is only a 2014 car, so give it a few years and it will probably depreciate further in value to a more affordable position. I know it's a sports car, but well worth a special mention anyway. Coming in at number 5 we have the Ferrari 308 GT4, otherwise known as the Ferrari Dino. This is because when the car was originally released in 1973 it was not a Ferrari, rather it was a Dino. Enzo Ferrari wanted to create a car that could appeal to a lower price range and take on cars like the Porsche 911, but didn't want to diminish the exclusivity of the Ferrari brand, hence the Dino brand was created. However. The Dino GT4 did not sell as many models as Enzo had expected, so the car was rebadged in 1976 to have the prancing horse that we all know and love. This means that some Ferrari purists still don't really accept the Dino as a legitimate Ferrari, and the car has been scoffed at by a few people including Jeremy Clarkson. Link as always in the description below. You've bought a, I bought a Ferrari. No, you G haven't. It is a Ferrari. It just isn't a Ferrari. What Richard had bought was never originally called a Ferrari. It was so slow and wet it was actually called a Dino. There's no point going, I bought my a George. It's from Asda. You've got a George it's car. A place. However, do you really care? I'd much rather go into my garage to find this than any old Corsa or Polo, it must be said. Also, the car was actually quite special. It was the first Ferrari to have a mid-engined V8 layout, which paved the way for the majority of Ferraris in succeeding decades. It was also the only ever 2x2 Ferrari to have factory support, so it has some history to it. Regardless, you get to be a part of the Ferrari Owners Club and wear your Ferrari merchandise knowing that you actually drive one, rather than just being a poser. You can pick the Dino up for around 40 grand, which might even be a good investment considering Hammond got his one in that episode of Top Gear for 10 grand in 2005. For your 40 grand, you get a 3 liter V8 engine that puts out 255 horsepower to its two rear wheels, taking it from 0 to 60 in 6.4 seconds. I'd be very happy with that. Ultimately, the benefit of buying this controversial and classic Ferrari supercar is the fact that it is a Ferrari. You know that the brand carries weight, even if the car itself doesn't. I mean, you get to drive a car that shares a badge with this, rather than this or this. A good candidate in its own right and well worth fifth on this list. I know I'd have one over my polo. Coming in at number 4 we have the 2009 Nissan GTR Black Edition. Of all the cars in this list, this is one of the two that I'm most interested in personally. This Japanese beast is well renowned for its history in motoring, picking up where the original Skylines left off for Nissan. It boasts a 3.8 litre V6 which puts out a huge 478 horsepower to all four wheels, making it the most powerful car on this list by a country mile. If that wasn't enough to whet your appetite, it does 0-60 in 3.4 seconds, again the quickest on this list. If it 
it wasn't for the fact that it sells at around 33 grand, it would easily be number one on this list based on all its specs. Just think about it for a minute. You have 33 grand and have the choice between the F-Type I mentioned earlier and this monster. I know which one I'd be taking home with me. The difference between the black edition and the normal GTR is the different rims you get on the black edition and a set of black and red leather interior, both of which I think are pretty cool and would be more than happy to buy. The black edition appears to be the cheapest of the GTRs, though you can get a low spec standard model for a similar price. The GTR is renowned for being a supercar killer but in my opinion it's certainly a supercar in its own right. It's incredible on a track, with reviews mentioning how ridiculous the traction is on it, and it will definitely turn some heads. It's basically the 4 seater equivalent of a supercar, and in my opinion it's well worth the supercar status. A key unique selling point of the GTR is the fact that it's Japanese, which means plenty of modification options for you to turn the basic beast into a personalised weapon. I think the most iconic rocket bunny car in the world is the Nissan, but that's just my opinion. Overall then, for 33 k you can have an absolute monster of a car instead of a brand new C200 AMG or a BMW 220i M Sport. Who would spend that money on a new and basic car when they could have a GTR? And number 3 this week we have one of my other two favourite cars on this list, the V8 Mark 1 Audi R8. When Audi decided the TT wasn't enough in 2003, they put together the Le Mans Quattro, which was the basis for the R8. The R8 has always meant to be the top of the range model from Audi, and there was some debate for quite a while over whether or not the original one was actually a supercar or just a very quick sports car. I would personally argue that the Mark 2 R8 is the more supercar-esque version of the two, but that's not to say that you can't class the original in the same category. When you see one in person, you still get that supercar feeling, it's not the kind of car you would ignore. The R8 definitely comes with supercar specs, as it has a 4.2 litre V8 running at 415 horsepower. It's a quattro, so four wheel drive and goes from 0 to 60 in 4.6 seconds. It's time for a manual alert. You can get the R8 as a manual for the same price as you would get an automatic. I just wanted to make sure you're aware of this fact. Supercar, manual gearbox, you know what to do. Of course, its faster and more powerful V10 equivalent is much more expensive and doesn't quite make the list. However, the V8 sells at around £32,000, which is pretty incredible for the specs you're getting, and probably a key reason why many YouTubers like Supercars of London end up buying them as an early way into supercar ownership. I know I personally would have one, especially as I think it looks a little bit more supercar-esque than the GTR, though I know this is a silly decision as it's practically worse in every way. But as I've mentioned in a previous episode, Audis hold a special place in my heart, so I could couldn't choose otherwise. As it's a cheap supercar, it also has a fair amount of modifications on the market, in case you're that way inclined. So, you can make your affordable beast even more personalised. For me, the main downside to the R8, and in fact the GTR, is the fact that they don't have much prestige behind their badges, which is probably why they are able to depreciate so much in value. Imagine if the R8 had a Lamborghini badge on it, as we know the Mark II V10 is pretty much the same car as the Huracan. It would never depreciate as much as the Mark I has. This is something you have to accept if you're looking to buy a supercar on the cheap, because the Huracan goes for a minimum of 130 grand second hand, while the Mark II Audi sells for 80 grand. You might be better off buying an Audi RS6 or something similar that has a value in its own right for the longer term investment. Irrespective of the badge, the Mark 1 V8 Audi R8 is a great option for a first supercar. Its incredible specs and performance make it brilliant value for money when compared with similarly specced cars from more prestigious brands with much higher price tags. Now onto the top two, and in second place we have two cars from the same manufacturer, the Aston Martin DB9 V12 and the Aston Martin V8 Vantage. The DB9 shares its 5.9 litre V12 with the Vanquish and puts out 450 horsepower to its two rear wheels, taking it from 0 to 60 in 4.7 seconds. It's time for another manual alert, you can get this car with a manual gearbox, though it's slightly out of our price range for this video, I just wanted to make sure you are aware of another V12 you can shift in the correct way. The V8 Vantage is another rear wheel drive Aston that boasts a 4.3 litre V8 which provides 380 horses, taking it from 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. And another manual alert, yes this car comes as a manual and yes it is within our price range, drop the flappy paddles and do it the good old fashioned way my friends. Especially as the auto version of this car isn't within our price range. Who would want to pay more for less fun? The V8 Vantage sells at about 28 grand whilst the DB9 goes for around 26 grand, meaning these British icons can provide you with supercar fun for less than the average price of a new car from the UK. Who's buying these new cars when they could have an Aston? A key reason why these cars are so cheap is the fact that they weren't actually Bond cars. As a huge Bond fan personally, this is a real shame, however the brand is practically synonymous with Bond, and I would still feel like 007 driving either of these cars. In fact, I'd probably only ever wear a suit while driving them just to enhance the experience 
experience even further. If you compare their prices to actual Bond cars like the Vanquish or DBS, you're unlikely to find one for much under £65,000. So for under half the price, you're still getting Bond level enjoyment, it's just that Bond didn't actually drive your car. For me, I would never say no to an Aston Martin. The only thing I'm not a huge fan of is the size. I feel like supercars need to be huge cars with massive presence, but that has never been part of the Aston way. When you look at a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, you just see how big the cars are, but the V8 Vantage in particular is actually quite a small car. I like it in some ways, as it's classic Aston, but I really don't know if they have the same supercar presence that some of the other cars on this list do. That's not to say that I wouldn't have one, of course. They're beautiful cars, and they're linked to James Bond himself. Overall then, both these Aston Martins provide a strong case for a supercar that you can buy on the cheap, and with such incredible specs, it would be hard to say no to putting one of these in your garage, especially as you get to pretend to be James Bond for the rest of your life. Finally, at number one, we have the Maserati Gran Turismo. Another week, another Maserati, but they're practically giving this one away, as it goes for as little as £20,000. Okay, not quite giving it away, but you get the idea. Again, some people might suggest this isn't really a supercar, as it's got four seats and isn't that comparable to a Lambo. However, its specs, and the hefty prices you would expect to pay on servicing and repair costs, suggest quite differently. The Gran Turismo has a 4.2 litre V8 that sounds absolutely incredible, as with most Maseratis. It's rear wheel drive and puts out 405 horsepower, taking it from 0 to 60 in just 5.2 seconds. That is dench specs for the money. For 20k, you're looking at the base model Gran Turismo from 2007. There are a number of different versions of the car, like the S, the MC, the MC Stradale, the Gran Cabrio, and many others, depending on year and specification, though most of these are out of reach when compared with the original. But so what? It's very unlikely you're going to come across another Maserati, let alone another Gran Turismo whilst cruising the streets in yours, which you can't boast about in any of the top of the range BMWs or Audis for example. The interior on the Gran Turismo is a masterpiece, as you would expect from Italian designers. Who doesn't want a car with Italian leather seats and that Trident logo stitched into the headrest? The exterior of the car is also supercar sized, and it demands a lot of attention with the amount of presence it has. I'm surprised more YouTubers haven't considered this as an option when they've been purchasing their first supercars. The fact that it has four seats and a bit more space than the R8 would definitely make it more of a dailyable supercar than anything else on this list, except the GTR of course. However, the low price in the Gran Turismo must be due to something. There is an argument that the Quattroporte is the better option as it comes with better features in terms of driver aid and general functionality. Also, as I mentioned before, many would argue it isn't really a supercar, but I think the best way of looking at it is as an aspirational supercar, just as Salamondrin suggested it's an aspirational Ferrari F12. I think the specs and presence and definitely the sound of this car place it right up there as a supercar, as I wouldn't put it in the same class as an F-Type or a TT but obviously I can see that it's not exactly a 488 or an Aventador. Overall, for £20,000, this is a really strong option and definitely deserves to be labelled a supercar simply because of its ratio of money to performance. Call it a poor man's Ferrari, call it an Italian C63 AMG, whatever you want to call it, it's cheap and well worth number one on this list, even if it is basically named after a PlayStation game. So, to recap, I've given you my take on the top 5 cheapest supercars you could buy today if you have about 40 grand to spend that is. Those were the Ferrari 308 GT4, the Nissan GTR Black Edition, the Mark 1 V8 Audi R8, the Aston Martin DB9 and Vantage, and the Maserati Gran Turismo, as well as the Jaguar F-Type as a special mention. If you agree or disagree with any of my picks, make sure to comment down below and let me know your reasons why. Remember to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel for more content like this, as well as other car related videos. If you have if you haven't seen my previous video on the top 5 cars to invest in, click the link in the outro screen to check that out. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, I'll see you in the next one. Listen.